Okay, welcome to part three. And as you can see here, we are starting the shadow pass. And you'll notice as well that the shadow pass, just as I mentioned earlier, is using exactly the same approach as I did the light pass. I took a soft brush, blocked in all of the shadows very quickly, brought the opacity down, create a new layer, apply the same settings I did in my second light pass, and I start to break apart these forms layer by layer by layer until I eventually flesh it out. The only major differences, if you can call them major, because they're not major at all, is A, the fact that I'm working from dark to light rather than light to dark. And the second is the fact that I'm playing with negative space rather than positive space. In the case where I was working with the lighting, where I applied my paint, where I applied the light, was to create the illusion that something was sticking out, okay? That it was sticking out of the surface. Whereas when I'm applying shadows, I'm using the, I'm adding shadow to create a sense of depth to make objects recede into that form, okay? So I'm just reversing my my headspace. But as you can see, it makes it's not difficult to figure out just by watching it. Now you'll notice as well as I slowly develop these shadows that I'm going to allow my shadows to gently overlap my lighting. Not all the way, I'm not going to go all the way around the form, because that's going to create something that might feel a little bit too bumpy, okay, a little bit too heavy on the eyes. The purpose of doing that is to create that nice, natural uh, transition from light to dark. I'm creating that illusion that there's a nice, smooth fall-off of light as it travels around this three-dimensional form. So I'm going to allow a bit of an overlap, but I'm going to use my eyes to gauge whether I'm going too far or not far enough, just to create that nice smooth transition between the two. Now we have a few minutes here where we can uh, discuss something else, something not uh, technical, because we've already watched this process before, so it's giving us a bit of free time. Now the thing I wanted to touch on is the subject of color. If you've looked at any of my YouTube videos, uh, any of the comments on my YouTube videos, um, you'll notice that often enough this, this question comes up, could you do something on color? And I've addressed color in, I did a little bit of a color psychology tutorial that's there as well that you can go check out. Um, but being asked this question personally and publicly as well, um, I thought this is an important subject and this is something that I really want to, I really do want to answer this question. However, I put a lot of thought into it, and I thought, do I want to take the same route that that we've already seen a thousand times? Am I going to do a color theory tutorial? Well, not really, because you can go on Google and do a search for color theory, and you'll get 10,000 hits, right? Explain everything you need. Color wheels, the history of color wheels, the history of color, uh, all the different types of uh, approaches to color, complementary, triadic bipolar, schizophrenic, right? It's all there. So I wanted to take an, a different approach. And the approach I always like hearing from others is the approach that gets you turned on to it, right? And what turns me on to color more than anything else? Well, it's the personal side of it. It's how it applies to me. It's my own personal form of self-expression, right? The way I perceive colors, the way Adam perceived colors, is completely different than how Bob perceives colors. It's completely different than how Jacques approaches colors. It's completely different than how Gilles approaches colors. We all have a different way of seeing things. And why is that? Well, it's because we have different life, exp we have different life experiences. We associate color to different things. Our culture plays a very important role in how we perceive colors, right? For instance, how somebody, how Western culture might perceive the color blue is one thing. How Eastern culture would perceive blue is a completely different story. Right? So that plays a lot into it as well. It's a personal thing. But what, I, what interests me about color is how it plays into the whole performance of a piece of art. And the reason I'm using the word performance is because one of the most valuable lessons I learned about color didn't come from painting, or from a painter for that matter. It came from a dancer. Because I've been dancing for almost as long as I've been working professionally as an artist, for about 15, 16 years, give or take, okay? And I remember hanging out one night with uh, with a very well-known swing dancer in Montreal. His name's Byron. And he was, he's a member of a swing dance troupe called the Swing Air Force. 
And we had gone out and we went to check out one of their performances. And after the performance, he came and sat down with me and we started to get into a, a discussion about performing, about dance per performing. More specifically, he was describing to me uh, what he had learned about how to, quote unquote, wow your audience, how to get their attention, how to make them cheer, how to get them all hyped up during a performance. And this is something that really resonated with me. He said, the very common mistake that dancers make, that performers make, is that they think that in order to get your audience riled up and excited, you need to deliver a high octane performance. In essence, that means you got to get up on that stage and for the full three to five minutes, you're going bang, 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 lift, split, smile, turn, spin, 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 jump, yay, okay? You got to do that for three minutes straight. And he goes, if you actually stop, he's, he had done enough performances at, at that time that he said, if you actually stop and look at the faces of the people in the audience, if you deliver that type of a performance, after about three to five minutes, at, after about the 30 seconds, you're going to notice that people's expressions start to fade. You're going to notice that they start to chat with their friends. You notice that they'll actually look at the wall and the ceiling for something more interesting to look at, rather than the performance going on right in front of their face. So the reason this happens is because you're exhausting their brain. You're overcharging their brain, right? You're wearing them out. And you're also giving away the goods too quickly. You're basically saying, punchline, 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 punchline. And people go, okay, I got it. Okay, okay, quiet. <laughs> Thank you. We're done. And they go looking elsewhere. You've exhausted their brain. So when you're, when he said the trick, the secret ingredient is you build it up slowly. You start a piece off where you expose them, expose them to something that shows your quality. So you say, I'm a good dancer. I have skill. And you make them go, ah, okay, now I'm paying attention. But you don't do so in a big obnoxious way. You do something cute and charming, something that shows that you have some charisma on stage. Then you give them gentle doses of it. You build it up slowly. A little bit here, gentle here, a little move there, a little ha ha, oh nice. Uh -huh. And then when people start to expect something from you at this point, they're going, okay, are you going to deliver the goods or not? You go, bang! And when you do that, they go, <gasps> and their heart goes, boom, 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 boom. You give them a little charge of adrenaline. But you didn't just overcharge. You didn't give them a freaking heart attack. You just gave them a little boost of adrenaline. What happens then? People lean forward. People look more closely. People start to get excited. Because now you've given them a little, char a little jolt. And now you're starting to give them expectations. Right? They're starting to anticipate something from you. They're starting to hope for something. So they lean forward in their chair. What do you do then? You let them start to fade again. They keep watching, they keep watching for another 10, 20 seconds, and then they start to go, okay, I guess that was it. And as soon as they say that, you go, bang, and you hit them with another, and their heart goes, boom, 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 boom. Now you're not letting them go. You're holding on to them. You're using the element of energy and contrast and surprise to attract their attention, to keep them on their toes. You're not letting them fall asleep on you. Okay. Now, how does this apply to color? Well, color is a performance. Color is energy. Color is your, the way you're going to grab their attention, the way you're going to control their attention, and the way you're going to keep their attention. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, if we translate this into colors, imagine energy as being saturation. The saturation of your color is how intense your performance is, how hard you're pumping it out. So if you're looking at a painting and you look at something, I'm talking about a painting, by the way. I'm not talking about a flat cartoon for kids. I'm talking about something that's a little bit more mature, a little bit more refined. If you go, if you approach your colors with red, yellow, blue, green, pink, turquoise, if you do that, that's like, that's the same as a high octane performance. You're just going punchline, 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 and people are just going to go, okay, you know what, this is just obnoxious. And they're going to flip to the next image, right? So how do you control that? You control that with your use of saturation. You control that with your use of contrast, high value and low value, right? 
You don't go bang, bang, bang and throw in red, pink, green, orange in high saturations because it's too high octane for people. Their brains are going to get tired of looking at that after a while. They're going to get tired of looking at it very quickly. So what do you do? You start gently. You give them a little dose at the very beginning to let them know that you're somebody who knows what they're doing, right? Your drawing, your sketch, your character, the overall image is that little dose of, pay attention to me, I'm qualified. You build your character, you get, you draw them in. As they explore your image, you're not going to hit them with heavy doses of color. You're going to work in a very loose and very playful way to keep their attention so that they don't fall asleep. They're not looking at the same value, same hue throughout. Little bits of pink, little bits of orange, little bits of green, but very desaturated, almost undistinguishable. Okay, The same way I did with my base tone. You notice how I played it up a little bit and I added some warm and cool hues? That's my way of saying, I'm not letting you go. Just keep paying attention. Okay? So little doses of little saturations of colors, so you're being playful and loose with it. And then, because your audience does have an expectation, I'm going to throw in these gems. Okay? I'm going to give them a blast of a saturation. I'm going to give them something that makes them go, oh, wow, okay, but I'm not going to throw it all over the screen or it's like, it's like, it's just obnoxious. It's going to exhaust their eyes. They need somewhere to, they need one strong memory in your design, in your creation. They need one, just one, okay? They don't need 10. So what you're going to do is you're going to play everything down very gently and then you're going to throw them that color that statement, that wow moment that gets their heart going, boom, 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 right? You want to get their heart rate going. And you decide what you want that color to be. So maybe it's red. If you play, if you have a lot of nice, soft, gentle tones of green and pink and all these different colors, and these oranges and yellows, all playing very gently into your piece, and then you decide to have this red, this bright, rich, saturated, like, dripping bloody lipstick lollipop red okay just something that makes people drool at the mouth and you don't give it in too high a dose that it overpowers everything else you play that dose gently and what you're doing is you're wowing them and the rest of it is when they've had enough of that red they can relax their eyes on everything else going on in your image but that red was that that red completely blew them off their feet it was a beautiful red now, as we progress through this painting, you're going to notice that that's very much how my head is working. Up until this point, all of the tones of the body, and you're going to notice the tones of the background as well when we get to that, but that comes at the very, very end, okay, are very subtle variations. It all blends in to play a very soft role. It's not, any, it's not obnoxious and loud. It's very subtle variations of color, very desaturated. Okay, look at the shadowed area of his leg right there. You see how desaturated it is? It's, it's almost gray, but it's not, right? Once I start building up the color of these gems, these gems are going to be the richest, juiciest violet you've ever seen. Okay, That was my goal. I wanted to wow people. And believe it or not, when I finally did post this on my, on my Facebook page, on my, on my art page, the first comment I got from any from from the first five people was that beard. I love the beard. When in fact what they were saying is I love that I love that fuchsia purple beard. I love the color. It's jumping out at me. As it stands right now, there's not it's not much to look at because I haven't even rendered it out. But that's the reaction I'm going to be creating. Okay. Now how do you decide how far you want to take colors? Right? Because like I said, it's personal. If you follow that exact recipe that I just gave you, or that figuratively exact recipe that I just gave you, then you're basically doing what I told you. You're not exploring your own personal style. You're not creating anything unique. Well, that's where knowing yourself is the most, plays the more, most important role in how you're going to go about this. Okay? And this is your own exploration. This is your own journey. It's not mine. I'm not going to take you by the hands for this. Nobody can. Only you can. Okay. What I mean by know yourself is, ask yourself, what type of person am I? Am I? 
Am I a jock? Am I an introvert? Am I a loudmouth schnook? Am I a businessman or a businesswoman? What type of person am I? How do people regard me? How do I regard myself? Deep down inside. I'm not talking about what I want people to think I am. I'm talking about what, do, what am I really? Okay? And before you can come to, gra to grips with that, the first thing you need to realize is, remember that when you watch TV, you listen to the radio, you're watching music videos, whatever the case might be, you are being presented with what society thinks you're supposed to look and act like. I'm supposed to be this good looking. I'm supposed to have this type of personality. I'm supposed to be flirtatious in this type of way. I need to wear these types of clothes. Yada, yada, yada. Right? Same old, same old. I've been seeing it for the last 37 years. It's nothing new to me. But it's not true. And it's not important. And the reason for this is, as an artist, you need to embrace who you are and show that off. If you're an introvert, realize being an introvert is not a flaw. Being an introvert is a personality type, and it's a very important one. Okay, The world needs introverts. Introverts play a very important role in today's society. However, what does school tell you? What does society tell you? You need to be more outgoing. Bull. When it comes to your art, you don't need to be more outgoing. You need to be yourself. If... <laughs> Would Kea Sedera be the artist she was today if she was some loudmouth schnook? No. Would I be charmed by her artwork if she was some loud, obnoxious person? No. What makes her unique and what makes her artwork beautiful is the fact that she's shy. And when I look at her artwork, her artwork is shy. And I love that about her because she's not telling me, she's not trying to impress me. She's exposing herself as who she is. And I'm taking a moment to step aside and appreciate that. She's not being somebody she's not. So how does that translate into color? Well, if you are the type of person who, when you walk into a room, you kick the door down and go, Behold! Here I am! Everybody admire me! If that's the type of person you are, then that's how you should approach color. Right? You want to make a big statement, a big loud statement, and your color should reflect that. Your personality should be reflected in it. If you're delicate, if you're shy, but you're somebody who likes to, sh you like people to appreciate the subtler things in life, that that's how you're going to approach your color. You're not going to throw in big, bold strokes, but you're going to have little hidden gems in there that people can appreciate if they take the time to look at it more closely. Okay? And if you're a jock, then maybe you might want to have the color of sports jerseys in there or something like that to show that there's a side of you that loves sports. It doesn't matter. But color is personal. And color is you surround yourself with the colors that make you feel closest to yourself, the things that connect with you on a personal level. So that's what you need to explore first. And once you do, how to go about your color is a question of intuition. It's a question of just knowing that and applying that to how you approach color, how you approach the application, the saturation, the value, the contrast of these colors so that they are a reflection of your personal self. Okay, back to technical for two seconds. Um, you'll notice that there are two things that I've started working on. Uh, one is I just did a pass of subsurface scattering. And again, if you want to have a better understanding of subsurface scattering, just go check out my, uh, my, my uh, Voodoo doll tutorial because I explain it more in depth. But in layman's terms, it's when light travels through a surface and reacts with the molecules underneath to create a warmth, to create an interior glow, something that happens under the surface, subsurface, right? So go and check that out. Um, but you'll also notice that I'm starting to flesh out the shape of these gems, right? And I have two different types of gems here. I have more square, jagged ones, and I have the rounded, tubular ones that are making up his beard, okay? You're also going to notice that I'm approaching this differently than I did the, the technique that I'm using to, to, to render these out is different than that of the body. Because in the case of the body, I did multiple passes, and I worked out these very intricate designs. In the case of the gems, however, I knew I wanted to get some sharp, jagged ed edges. So I'm actually using my lasso tool to erase out, to, to uh, outline and erase areas where the light meets the dark to get those nice, sharp edges. 
and this is yet another technique you can use when trying to achieve that kind of result.